was this. Now, I don't pick these titles or topics, so this was the one that was assigned to me. And uh, it's a book I never wanted to write. <laughs> I didn't really intend to write. Uh, I think it all started, more or less. I mean, I have friends, some of my best friends are Calvinists. We've had our discussions in years gone by. We've agreed to disagree and dropped it because neither one of us was convincing the other. But I think it was August, it'll be two years this coming August, that I did just a little Q&A. How many of you get the Brian call, by the way? Oh, wow, quite a few. About 70%, I think, or more. Um, well, you know we have a Q&A section in there. And um, I, I did just a little Q&A on Calvinism. Somebody asked, and we, get, we are asked uh, questions on a variety of topics, and we don't exclude anything. We don't shy away from anything. So they're asking me about Calvinism. I guess I'm entitled to give my opinion. <laughs> Uh, from what I think uh, the Bible says, wow, never received such a storm of angry letters from all over the world, many of them from pastors who said things like, well, we've appreciated your ministry for the last 10 years, your stand for truth and against error, but now you have attacked Calvinism. Take me off your mailing list. I'm instructing all my people to get off your mailing list. We want nothing further to do with you. Whoa. I never expected such a reaction as that. I mean, I don't break fellowship with uh, Calvinists who disagree with me. It almost reminded me of the Catholics, and Greg would certainly relate to this. The Catholics call us uh, <clears throat> anti-Catholic because we disagree with them. But they don't call themselves anti-Protestant or anti-evangelical. You'd think it ought to go both ways. We're called Catholic bashers, but they don't call themselves uh, evangelical bashers. <laughs> uh, well, the title of the book, <clears throat> my wife came up with it. She's a more gentle soul than I am. Uh, and the subtitle is <laughs> what I have as the title, I guess, Calvinism's Misrepresentation of God. But the title, What Love Is This? If we didn't have a subtitle, you might think it was some uh, devotional by Dave Hunt on uh, love. Um, well, why, why should I enter into a controversy that's been going on for 450 years? I mean. Calvinists and non-Calvinists have debated back and forth. Um, I'm not going to settle anything. But as the months went by, we got more and more letters. Uh, I think I did another Q&A and that created more of a storm. Uh, we began to hear from people who said, uh, Calvinism has just split our church. Uh, we got a new pastor and he's forcing this on everyone. Anyone who's not a Calvinist has to get out, or we heard it the other way. Churches where if you were, uh, if you were a Calvinist, they put you out. This, this Sunday school teacher has been, we've warned him, and he keeps pushing Calvinism on his class, and so we finally, you know, <clears throat> had to put a stop to it. Uh, I began to find that Calvinists seem to be very aggressive, uh, more so than anyone else. <laughs> I was astonished by that. I was on some talk shows that were not uh, really uh, run by Calvinists. They, they were just um, evangelical talk shows, and the only people that called in were Calvinists. I mean, they seemed to get to the, <laughs> to the phone first. Uh, well, it's, um, it's been heating up, and uh, R.C. Sproul in America, I don't know if he's on the air over here, but he's on the radio every day pushing Calvinism. And we're beginning to find out that more and more people that we didn't really know were Calvinists are Calvinists, and they're becoming more uh, aggressive in 
uh, pushing this doctrine. Uh, John MacArthur, for example, uh, many people don't didn't know that, but if you look at his writings, um, and J.I. Packer, uh, B. James Kennedy, of course, because Presbyterians are Calvinists. What uh, began to concern us a bit uh, is some are some of the claims. Now let me just uh, quote uh, some some of them. Calvinism, I'm quoting some Calvinists now, quote, Calvinism is pure biblical Christianity in its clearest and purest expression. Well, then if you're not a Calvinist, you're not a Christian, I, 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 it seems to follow. But John Piper, I imagine that name would be known at least to some of you, he writes, quote, the doctrines of grace, that is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, are the warp and woof of the biblical gospel cherished by so many saints for centuries. So if Calvinism, the five points of Calvinism are the, are the warp and woof of the biblical gospel, and you don't preach five point Calvinism, wouldn't it then follow you're not preaching the gospel? Uh, now it becomes rather serious. Uh, well, your own C.H. Spurgeon, by the way, most of you don't know, I rarely mention this. My father named me after Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> uh, my name, you know, you British, my father was British, and you British have sometimes multiple middle names. And uh, my father named me David Charles Haddon Spurgeon Hunt. My mother thought Spurgeon was a bit too much, and she redlined that one. So my name actually is David Charles Haddon Hunt, okay? <laughs> So Spurgeon and I should get along well. Uh, Spurgeon wrote, I do not ask whether you believe Calvinism. It is possible you may not, but I believe you will before you enter heaven. I am persuaded that as God may have washed your hearts, he will wash your brains before you enter heaven. Uh, uh, John Gerstner uh, says, we believe with the great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon that Calvinism is just another name for Christianity. Let me just give you some other quotes. I mean, I would think your level of concern would, would rise a bit. Uh, another Calvinist says, this teaching was held to be the truth by the apostles. Another Calvinist says, Christ taught the doctrines which have come to be known as the five points of, of Calvinism. Uh, Another one says, well, this is a man named Copps, a well-known Calvinist. God's plan of salvation revealed in the scriptures consists of what is popularly known as the five points of Calvinism. Uh, Lorraine Bettner, uh, one of the great apologists against the Roman Catholic Church, says, quote, the great advantage of the Reformed faith is that in the framework of the five points of Calvinism, it sets forth clearly what the Bible teaches concerning the way of salvation. Another one says, quote, if you do not know the five points of Calvinism, you do not know the gospel, but some perversion of it. B.B. Uh, Warfield, uh, one of the classics, uh, says Calvinism is evangelicalism in its purest and only stable expression. Another one says Calvinism is the gospel and to teach Calvinism is, in fact, to preach the gospel. Well, I, I would think some of you might be a bit concerned now uh, that you haven't preached the gospel yet, uh, if you haven't been preaching Calvinism. It's called Reformed Theology. I get just a little bit upset about that. Uh, they've hijacked the Reformation. What do you mean, Reformed Theology? <clears throat> John Calvin was eight years old when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Chapel. Uh, there's a lot more to the Reformation than Calvinists. There were the Mennonites, there were the Zwinglians, I mean, there were a number of others. <laughs> and now to say that this is Reformation doctrine, this is it, they've hijacked the Reformation. 
Then again, they will say, you're not a Calvinist. You reject the great Reformation creeds. I don't know how many of you have heard that. I've had that accusation many times. Oh, you reject the great Reformation creeds. Reformation creeds? What do you mean, Reformation creeds? What are the great Reformation creeds? Oh, well, they're talking about, <clears throat> uh, you British are responsible for part of it, the Westminster Assembly. <laughs> uh, the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, right here in England. Or the Synod of Dort in Dortmund, Holland. Well, as a matter of fact, this was a state church. <clears throat> and uh, let me just quote some historians for you about this. In 1643, I'm quoting G.T. Bethany, in 1643 the Westminster Assembly of Divines was convened by Parliament to reform the Church of England. And now we've got Parliament is in charge, and I don't know if you would want Parliament to be in charge of reforming uh, your your evangelical church today. They paid the salaries, they paid the expenses of these people. Uh, and uh, uh, he goes on, he talks about ejections of Episcopalians from their livings amounted to some thousands. So many vacancies were created, they could not be filled. <clears throat> he says the Presbyterians predominated in Parliament and in 1648 showed their continued intolerance by enacting that all who denied God or the Trinity or the Atonement or the canonical books of Scripture or the resurrection of the dead and a final judgment were to suffer the pains of death as in case of felony without benefit of clergy. A long catalog of heresies of the second class was specified to be punished by Im imprisonment. In other words, uh, this was a state church and they were enforcing it on everyone. And if you did not agree with them, you were thrown out. Uh, and in some cases, killed. In many cases, imprisoned. I'm quoting another uh, uh, historian who says, the Westminster Assembly was called and financed by Parliament and was controlled by Presbyterians. Baptists and independents were excluded by design. In fact, Baptists and independents were regarded as, quote, mortal enemies of the state church. Unquote. Tolerance for any religious belief other than Calvinism was denounced by leading members of the assembly as, quote, the last and strongest hold of Satan. Wow. The assembly was determined to enforce its brand of religion upon the entire population. This happened here in, in England. Now you have a wonderful man. The letters of Samuel Rutherford, I'm sure many of you have read them. Uh, I mean, so beautiful, uh, yet, and, and historians describe Rutherford as, quote, a gracious and godly man, unquote. Yet because of his Calvinist beliefs, he denied absolutely the moral principles underlying religious tolerance. Sounding like the popes and the Vatican he despised, he even went so far as to declare, quote, there is but one true church, <clears throat> and all who are outside of it are heretics who must be destroyed. Uh, is that what Calvinism does to an otherwise very godly, loving and gracious uh, man? Roger Williams, one of the best known advocates of religious freedom in his day, published a protest titled, The Bloody Tenant, means bloody tenant, of persecution for cause and conscience. He fled England for America, where he was badly treated by the Puritans. In England, the Westminster Assembly had his book publicly burned. In 1648, the Presbyterians succeeded in enacting the gag law to punish the Baptists as blasphemers and heretics. I find it rather ironic that many Baptists today are Calvinists. Um, under this infamous law, 400 Baptists were thrown into prison. In fact, dissenters had been suffering persecution and imprisonment for years. Now you all know what happened under Bloody Mary <laughs> and, and the uh, persecution and burning at the stake of over 400 uh, evangelicals for rejecting uh, 
you know, transubstantiation. But maybe most of you didn't know about this persecution by the Calvinists. Um, Protestants suffering at the hands of fellow Protestants for not being Calvinists. Nearly 30 years before the following entreaty titled, quote, a most humble supplication of many of the king's majesty's loyal subjects who are persecuted only for differing in religion contrary to divine and human testimonies. That's the title he gave his letter. It was smuggled out of prison. And listen to what he said. <clears throat> Our miseries are long and lingering imprisonments for many years in diverse counties of England in which many have died and left behind them widows and many small children, taking away our goods, not for any disloyalty to your majesty, nor hurt to any mortal man, but only because we dare not assent unto and practice in the worship of God such things as we have not faith in, because it is a sin against the Most High. This is not the Catholics who are persecuting them. This was Protestant uh, England now, and they were being persecuted for not embracing uh, Cal Calvinism. Well, you say they're not that way today, and I guess they're not because they don't have the power to do it, but I can tell you that, wow, this book, I could not imagine what a storm it has created on the internet, and Mark just told you, tear the cover off and send it in, and we'll send you a copy of a, a book promoting uh, Calvinism. Well, what are they pushing, or what is the T U L I P, an acronym uh, uh, that uh, some someone has said a beautiful flower but bad theology. Well, that depends upon your point of view, of course. And we may have some Calvinists in in the audience today. Uh, pages eighty nine and ninety. Uh, I give you what they believe, uh, and I quote from the Westminster Confession and the Canons of Dort and so forth to make sure that um, I'm, I'm not misrepresenting them. And um, as most of you know, the T stands for total depravity. Now, uh, if you were asked, do you believe in total depravity? Probably most Christians would say, yeah, but I have some little question about total. What do you mean by total? Uh, but the Calvinist means by total depravity, he means inability. A non-Christian, even those who have been elected and predestined to heaven by God from a past eternity uh, until they have been regenerated, every person on this earth uh, by nature is unable to believe the gospel, unable to respond, unable to accept Christ, <laughs> totally unable. By total depravity, they mean inability, okay? Uh, the U, of course, stands for unconditional election, that God decides on no basis uh, within the person, um, it has nothing to do with whether they, whether they believe or not. He decides to save them. Uh, let me quote the canons of Dort. That some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not receive it proceeds from God's eternal decree, which decree he graciously, by which decree he graciously softens the hearts of the elect, however obstinate, and inclines them to believe while he leaves the non-elect in his just judgment to their own wickedness and obduracy. L stands for limited atonement. Uh, Christ did not die for everyone. Uh, Calvinism is, um, is a bit difficult. In fact, I've been warned, I was warned by many, uh, even friends, don't write a book about Calvinism, you don't understand it. I mean, this takes years of study. But if it's the gospel, if it's Bible, the Bible says that even a child can understand the scriptures. In 2 Timothy 3.15, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, From a child you've known the holy scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation. I've been a Christian for 63 years, studying the Bible on my knees. <laughs> but I'm not competent <laughs> to handle... Uh, Calvinism, this is what they told me very sincerely. Uh, it must be very esoteric, it must be very complicated. 
And I would just ask you, how many children in Sunday school, when you read John 3.16 to them, how many Sunday school children with a heart open to the Lord would understand from the words of Scripture that Christ didn't really die for everyone? That when it says God so loved the world, it only means he loved the elect. Uh, and he only gave his only begotten son to die for the elect. Uh, where would you get this idea? Uh, how would an ordinary person come to this understanding? Limited atonement, Christ did not die for all. Dort declares, for this was the sovereign counsel and most gracious will and purpose of God the Father, that the most precious death of his son should extend to all the elect, all those and those only who were from eternity chosen to salvation, he purchased by his death. Now the Calvinists have many arguments, and we go into them all in the book, we don't have time for that, but the Calvinists would say, you mean some of Christ's blood is wasted? I mean, if Christ shed some of his blood uh, for people who will end up in hell, then his blood was wasted. Wait a minute, you can't divide the blood of Christ up and say some was shed for this person, some for that person. If there was only one sinner on earth, all of Christ's blood would have to be shed. Is that not true? Uh, he paid the penalty for sin, not just for individual sins. Then the I stands for irresistible grace. Let me quote the Westminster Confession, quote, all those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death, effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. Now we have a problem, and we go into it in quite some length in the book. Many Calvinists deny that man has a will, that man can even make a choice, even though Christ says, you know, if any man wills to do his will, he will know, John 7, 17, uh, because the Calvinist makes God the cause of everything. They overdo sovereignty to the extent that no one, you can't even sin independently of God, that he is the cause of ev everything. Uh, so then, if you're gonna be saved, God must irresistibly cause you to believe. So grace, I think that's, that's a, a misnomer. How can grace be irresistible? It's not gracious to force something on someone, is it? Uh, and then they've got the will to deal with. Oh, well, he graciously changes their will um, without making them be willing. I don't know how you would do that. Uh, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Now, unless we gave this person a new will, no, they don't say that. He has a will, and somehow this will has been changed without his, uh, his agreement to it. <laughs> but it, graciously, he has been changed, so now his will wills something else. I don't think you can do that. That's like, uh, you know, we'll talk about it, I guess, tomorrow, or to maybe this evening, the Taliban. That's one of the problems with, um, with Islam. You don't even have to believe. You don't even have to be willing. <laughs> they put a sword <laughs> today in Indonesia, a machete at your, at your neck and say, you will confess. There is no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet or off with your head. You don't even have to believe. But what does the Bible say? Well, the Ethiopian eunuch says, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Well, Philip says, puts a sword at his throat and says, you will, or else. Uh, no, Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, with all your heart. Now, what does it mean, believe with my heart? <laughs> uh, if somehow God is going to cause me to believe what I didn't want to believe. <laughs> uh, well, we'll get more into that. But we got a little problem with the will. Martin Luther wrote an entire book, The Bondage of the Will. And uh, I've had Calvinists say to me, well, have you read Martin Luther's Bondage of the Will? Yes, I have, and I could punch enough holes in there to drive a fleet of trucks through it. I don't think too highly of Martin Luther's exegesis and, 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 and logic even. Uh, for example, he will take 
Psalm 73, where the psalmist says, I was looking at the, at the prosperity of the wicked, and I became envious of them. And because they, there are no bands in their death, I mean, they seem to prosper. And here I am, I'm trying to please God, and things are just going so bad for me. And then the psalmist says, so foolish and ignorant was I. I didn't realize their end. In the end, <laughs> they're going to get it. <laughs> and he says, so foolish and ignorant was I. I was as a beast before thee. Oh, Martin Luther jumps on that and he says, you see, the will of man is like a beast. If God rides it, it goes where God wants it to go. If Satan rides it, it goes where Satan wants it to go. That is not what that psalm is about. That is not what that psalm says. And Martin Luther does that continually um, in, in, in that book. And the Calvinist is, is very firm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but that man does not have uh, a, a, a will. Well, the P, the I, irresistible grace, the P stands for perseverance of the saints. Uh, Westminster, that God will not allow any of the elect to lose the salvation which he has sovereignly given them. And uh, I thought that I was a, at least a one-point Calvinist because I believe in eternal security, and I'm sure probably some of you here don't. But Jesus said, I give my sheep eternal life, they will never perish. I think if I had eternal life today and I didn't have it tomorrow, it would be a strange kind of eternal life. Uh, and it's not to my credit. And if I somehow have to continue uh, in the faith to such an extent that I keep my salvation, then I think I could walk the golden streets up there and boast a little bit. Lord, it was wonderful that you died for me, but I did do my part too. Uh, I kept myself saved. Um, Jesus said, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation. That seems like a promise. But has passed from death to life. Now, I believe that I am saved eternally because Christ promised that, and I have accepted his promise. But the Calvinist believes He's saved eternally because he's one of the elect. Whoa, now we got a problem. We'll get to that. How do you know you're one of the elect? That is a real problem. Plague the Puritans with doubts about their salvation. And I will even, if I get to it, I will even quote to you uh, R.C. Sproul. Uh, I think that name would probably be known uh, expressing his doubts about his salvation because his performance wasn't quite up to what he thought it ought to be. Okay, so I don't think you could come to these conclusions just as an ordinary person reading the Bible. Um, Calvinism has been imposed on the Bible and they have this framework of belief and now they try to interpret the Bible in such a way that it uh, says what they want it to say. Now, Calvinism comes from Augustine. All of the Calvinists acknowledge this. Calvin quotes Augustine in his Institutes about that thick, which I've gone through very carefully. Uh, John Calvin quotes Augustine more than 400 times, including phrases such as, by the authority of Augustine, a Spurgeon said, uh, quote, Calvin derived it, that is Calvinism, mainly from the writings of Augustine. John Calvin said, Augustine is <clears throat> so holy with me that if I wished to write a confession of my faith, I could do so with all fullness and satisfaction to myself out of his writings. I quote many Calvinists uh, in, in the book, who just one after another says, well, R.C. Sproul says, quote, Augustinianism is presently called Calvinism or Reformed theology. They all acknowledge John Calvin is not the originator of Calvinism, but John Calvin got this doctrine from Augustine. And Augustine was the first one who came up with these ideas. Well, who was Augustine? Well, some of you may know that um, 
He's one of the four, uh, well, we have some ex-Catholics here, I would think you would know. He's one of the original four doctors of the church. They have a feast day, August 28th, uh, the day of his death. In 1986, the Pope celebrated uh, the 1600th uh, anniversary of his, uh, of his um, conversion. He quoted one of the things that Augustine said. Augustine said, quote, I should not believe the gospel unless, to move, unless moved to do so by the authority of the church. I've had a Catholic apologist quote that to me to confirm the authority of the Catholic church. This is where our authority uh, comes from. Uh, Sir Robert Anderson said, quote, the Roman Catholic Church Another one of your own here in Britain. The Roman Catholic Church was molded by Augustine into the form it has ever since maintained. Of all the errors that later centuries developed, scarcely one cannot be found in embryo in his writings. Among them you would have infant baptism for salvation, the necessity of baptism for salvation. Salvation is only in the church and its sacraments. Persecution of all who reject of this teaching, the acceptance of the Apocrypha, allegorical interpretation of the Bible. You don't take the uh, first few chapters of Genesis seriously. This is allegory, uh, and we allegorize, they, they allegorize much else. It comes from Augustine. Uh, he rejected the, <clears throat> uh, the millennium, the literal reign of Christ uh, upon the earth. Uh, actually, we're in the millennium now. You read that in his book, The City of God. Satan is locked up, in case you hadn't noticed that. Uh, and the church is in the process of taking over. You know, this sort of thing is the kingdom, uh, dominion teaching now among many charismatics uh, that we're going to take over. This all comes from Augustine, but it is very Catholic. Uh, historian Philip Schaff says, quote, the f he calls Augustine, quote, the first real Roman Catholic, <clears throat> the principal theological creator of the Latin Catholic system <clears throat> as distinct from evangelical Protestantism. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let me quote John Piper. Um, I can find it quickly here. John Piper says, the stand, and now this is shocking, and, and um, one of my chapters is titled, I guess I don't call it the shocking, the surprising uh, Roman Catholic connection. Uh, listen to Piper, and they all agree on this. The standard text on theology that Calvin and Luther drank from was Sentences by Peter Lombard. Nine-tenths of this book consists of quotations from Augustine. Luther was an Augustinian monk and Calvin immersed himself in the writings of Augustine. As we can see from the increased use of Augustine's writings in each new edition of the Institutes. Paradoxically, one of the most esteemed fathers of the Roman Catholic Church gave us the Reformation. Ooh, isn't that amazing? The two best known fathers of the, of the Protestant Reformation, Calvin and Luther, were heavily under the influence of Augustine, the premier Roman Catholic. That's a little bit shocking, isn't it? Now that would explain to you why Reformed churches today still believe in infant baptism for salvation. That uh, would include uh, your own church here, <laughs> Church of England, doesn't it? Uh, isn't that what they teach? Now we got a problem. You will find this. This is what the Reformation left all across Europe. I talk to these people all the time. They were never saved. They got baptized. And they got catechized. They got reformed. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, they were confirmed. And I've had them say to me, we, we, were inter we went to our confirmation because you got a lot of gifts from your relatives. At least that's in Europe and Germany and so forth. Uh, and then they get married in the church, and they get buried in the church. Other than that, they never darken the door of the church. And it has turned many, many people against Christianity, so-called. Uh, 
And look, if I was baptized as a baby and that saved me, uh, and this goes for Lutherans as well as Presbyterians, then you wouldn't preach the gospel to me. Paul said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. But why would you want me to get saved when I already was regenerated, all my sins forgiven as, a, as an infant when I was baptized? Now we've got a very serious error. Uh, and in fact, John Calvin said, the one sure way to know you're one of the elect is if you were baptized as a baby, even by a fornicating, godless, unbelieving Roman Catholic priest, and you have faith in your baptism. You know, these people were called Anabaptists, remember? Baptized again. These were people who had been Catholics. They got saved by the grace of God through believing the gospel, faith in Christ. And they said, but baptism is for believers. <laughs> Didn't he say to the Ethiopian eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, and a baby can't believe, it doesn't even know anything, we ought to get baptized now as believers. And they were hated, persecuted, and killed, not just by the Catholics, but by the uh, Lutherans and the Calvinists. Is that not true? You still find that animosity today. I don't know about in England, but I know the continent much better. And someone who gets saved and gets baptized out of the Lutheran church or Calvinist church, they're, wow, their family won't have anything to do with them in many instances. Not always, but in many instances. You have denied the efficacy of your infant baptism. Uh, and that's a very serious, uh, serious problem. So we have something rather astonishing. <laughs> the Catholic connection to both Calvin and Luther and what it has left in the so-called Reformed churches uh, through the Reformation process. Now, Augustine was called the father of the Inquisition. Uh, he was a Constantinian. Remember Constantine, the Roman em emperor, uh, he gave freedom to uh, the Christians. I mean, what's the point of persecuting the Christians? I mean, they, they don't get drunk, they don't carouse, they're honest, they're moral, they're hard workers. Why are you killing them? Maybe some of this will rub off on the rest of them. They're good citizens. And he was not a Christian. He continued to offer sacrifices to pagan deities. He continued to preside over the pagan uh, feasts as head um, of the pontifical college. Uh, he didn't stop the uh, sacrifices to the great goddess Vesta. Uh, put out the Vestal Virgins. He had the Sun God, not the Son of God, on his coins and so forth. That's Constantine. All he was interested in was uniting his empire. And if you want to study ecumenism, study Constantine. He's the first ecumenist. He called the great ecumenical council, 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea. He presided over, gave the opening speech and so forth. And he thought by giving freedom to these Christians, he could unite his empire. To his shock, he found out these Christians are divided. They don't get along with one another. And so he called the Council of Nicaea to straighten out certain things. And he imposed, finally, uh, you will agree or else. And that's what Augustine did. The controversy with the Donatists. You remember the Donatists? Uh, they were a little bit uh, upset because some of the bishops and, and, and ordinary believers as well had renounced Christ under the persecution of Diocletian and others. To save getting killed, they had renounced Christ. And now when, when Constantine comes in power and he's giving freedom to the church, uh, they said, well, we didn't really mean it. <laughs> we really were Christians the whole time. And they were embraced back in the church, as well as people, I mean, Augustine, I could quote Augustine, he says, you go to church today, you'll see sorcerers, astronom astrologers, clients uh, uh, of these people. You'll see people wearing amulets, and so, I mean, 
the same pagans that go to the pagan festivals are in the church. Augustine thought that was fine. Everyone must be in the church. The Donatists said, no, the church should be believers, only true believers. And these people who renounced Christ under persecution, they're going to have to repent of this, and they're going to have to get saved again <laughs> and uh, be baptized. And Augustine was not happy. They wanted a pure church. Augustine, well, he says he didn't really want to kill them, but if you had to, if you had to kill people to force them back in uh, to the faith, then Augustine was in favor of that, okay? So now you would understand a little bit, and I don't know the Calvinists get upset with me by going to Geneva, uh, pointing out what happened in Geneva. Uh, John Calvin would flog you, torture you. They, they tortured people. They burned more than 60 people at the stake in Geneva under John Calvin. Talk about thought police. They knock on your door. You've got too many dishes on the table. Uh, a lady that had her hair bouffant a little bit too high in, in jail and so forth. Uh, the death penalty for many crimes, a, a, a child that badmouthed his parents had its head cut off. So John Calvin, because he believes in a God who forces people into heaven with irresistible grace, it's called, uh, and a God who doesn't care that millions, probably billions, go to hell. In fact, he has predestined them to go there and has made it out so that they can't even understand the gospel. He will not give them the grace they need to understand and to believe. Well, I think maybe that would flavor your actions, wouldn't it? And I have Calvinists who try to defend John Calvin. And they say, well, yeah, but you know, everybody did it in those days. <laughs> the popes were doing it and so forth. And wait a minute. First John chapter 2, John says, He that says he abides in him, that is in Christ, ought himself so to walk as he walked. It doesn't matter what society you live in, what time in history you live in, is not my life supposed to reflect Christ living in me? But I don't think you would find that in John Calvin. Oh, he was very kind. He prayed a lot. He wore himself out preaching sermons. He also tortured those who disagreed. He also banished them, flogged them, and, and, and so forth. Well, that comes from Augustine, who's been called the father of, of the Inquisition. That goes to the heart of the issue. What love is this? God is love. And you can get in lengthy discussions with Calvinists, and you can go round and round on the finer points of doctrine. Let me just point this out. The bottom line, what all of their arguments are aimed at is to prove to you that God does not love everyone, that God does not want everyone in heaven, that Christ did not die for everyone, but that in fact God is pleased to damn millions and you would have to say billions to hell. Now when I say to the Calvinists, uh, I talk about uh, a, a relatively few elect, the Calvinist says, no, no, we don't mean few elect, I mean uh, there's a great multitude in heaven, that's what the Bible says of every tribe and tongue. Well, yes, but I say, look, don't jump on me for saying that. Jesus said it, didn't he? Didn't they ask him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Jesus said, strive to enter at the, at the straight gate. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Now you've got two choices. Either the broad road filled with people on their way to hell is because they have made a choice of their own free will, and they have rejected a gospel that they could have believed if they wanted to, or God predestined them to go to hell. And the vast majority of mankind, this broad road, is because God predestined them from eternity 
past. And that's what Calvinism teaches. And John Calvin said, it is to the glory of God. It is his good pleasure that he damns so many. So we have to decide. And this is, this is the, uh, the issue in essence. Does God love everyone? God is love, the Bible says. It tells us his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. And he requires us to be the same, does he not? Didn't Jesus say, be ye merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful? But if my heavenly Father is only merciful to certain ones, then I can be only merciful to certain ones, right? If I'm to be merciful as my heavenly Father is merciful. But Micah 6, 8 says that I am to love mercy. And uh, Micah 7, 18 says that God delighteth in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 says he is rich in mercy, and I quoted already Psalm 145, 9, his tender mercies are over all his works. And Romans 11:32 tells us that God has pronounced both Jew and Gentile, quote, all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. I believe that the Bible teaches that God loves everyone. He's not willing that any should perish. So the Calvinist says, no, that means he's not willing that any of the elect should perish. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, you know it well, love is kind. Love is kind. How can you interpret predestining multitudes to eternal torment as being kind? That's not a matter of God's sovereignty, you understand. God has the right to send anybody to hell that he wants to, right? We would agree with that. He's sovereign. I can't argue. In fact, we all deserve to go to hell, right? That's not the issue. The issue is, is God kind? Is he loving? Uh, I don't think it's loving to send people to hell, predestine them to go to hell. They can't even believe the gospel. They don't have a chance. Well, we'll get more into that. I think it's a misrepresentation of, of God. Listen to J.I. Packer. Quote, God loves all in some ways. Everyone whom he creates receives many undeserved good gifts. He loves some in all ways. That is, he brings them to faith to new life and to glory according to his predestinating purpose. The Calvinist uh, tries to say, uh, well, let me quote a British editor. I, 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 editor, you would know him. I'm not going to give his name. He wrote to me a bit angrily. He said, quote, the plain truth is that God does not wish to save all men. If he did, then he would save them. Now, the Calvinists would say, now wait a minute, you mean to say that someone can, uh, you mean to say that it is God's will, he, would, he wants all, all to be saved? That's what the Bible says. And you mean to say that man can frustrate God's will? Well, they do it all the time. Jesus said that the Pharisees had rebelled against God. Who keeps the Ten Commandments? They weren't ten suggestions. Didn't God intend that man should keep these? Wouldn't you say that that would be God's will? But people go against God's will continually. Why would Jesus say to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, if God's will is already being done here? What would be the point? Uh, and, and Paul, well, you know what he said in Romans chapter 9, 
He said, I could wish myself accursed of God for my brethren, the Jews. Isn't that what Paul said? Didn't Paul say, I would go to hell for them. If that would save the Jews, I would be willing to go to hell myself. I don't know that any of us could say that, but that's what Paul said. Where did he get this love? Where did he get this compassion for mankind? Now understand, wouldn't it be blasphemy for Paul to be concerned about the salvation of people that God had already predestined to eternal damnation? Paul, how can you do this in the face of God? Who says it is for his good pleasure that he has damned most of these people? And you say you would be willing to die? You would be willing to suffer eternally for them? Paul, how could you do this? You're going against God. You see, you can't really show concern and compassion for anyone who's not one of the elect because God has no concern or compassion for any of them. In, in the book, we quote Jay Adams, for example, uh, in his book, Competent to Counsel. I mean, Jay Adams is, is a friend uh, and we offer that book. But in that book, he says, the counselor cannot say to the counselee, Christ died for you because you don't know whether he's one of the elect. Well, I think Christ said, preach the gospel to every creature, didn't he? But wait a minute, isn't it? mockery to preach the gospel and seemingly offer salvation to people who are blinded and to whom God refuses to give the grace to believe. You know, I use the example in the Brian call, you got a man in the bottom of a well and you're standing up above and you're holding a rope 30 feet above his head and saying, grab a hold of it. Come on, I want to pull you out of there. I mean, he'd think you were mad. I mean, he'd like to grab your throat, maybe. Uh, if you want me to come out, why don't you lower it down to where I can get it? And the Calvinist says, oh, what an illustration. I mean, it's not, a, we don't hold on. Well, that wasn't the point. The point was, the man on top is obviously not sincere, is he? And for God to plead with people to repent, from whom he withholds the very grace that they need, and without it, they can't repent, and yet he pleads with them to repent, but at the same time, he withholds what they need to repent. <laughs> I don't think that's sincere. And I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches, but that's what Calvinism has done. I think it's a misrepresentation of God. Um, R.C. Sproul, it, quote, it says, quote, if some people are not elected to salvation, and obviously multitudes are not, apparently the majority are not. If broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there be, it doesn't say few there be that God has predestined, few there be that find it. Oh yeah, but that's a mockery because you can't find it unless he gives you the grace, special grace, irresistible grace. Uh, he says, if some people are not elected to salvation, then it would seem that God is not at all that loving toward them, and it would have been more loving of God not to have allowed them to be born. Whoa. You see, now we got a problem, a very serious problem. And the atheist will throw it in your face. Why all of this suffering in the world? You believe in eternal hell? Why? I mean, if your God is too weak to stop suffering and evil, then he couldn't be God. And if he could, but he doesn't, he's a monster. That's what the atheist will throw at you. Wait a minute. It's not a question of power. Irresistible grace. The Calvinist says, are you saying that the sovereign, all-powerful God can't cause everyone he wants to believe to believe? Um, most of you, uh, I don't know how long you've been getting the Breen Call, but maybe it was a year or so ago. I wrote an article titled, What a Sovereign God Cannot Do. Does anybody remember that article? Well, a few people, okay. Uh, wow, did I get letters. 
you're saying that a sovereign God can't do anything he wants to do? Well, he can't be wrong, can he? He can't fail. He can't deny himself. He can't sin. He can't lie. A lot of things a sovereign God can't do because of who he is. And love is not a matter of power. You don't point a gun at a young lady, and you, you bachelors, and say, you will love me. Okay, okay. No, love is not a matter of power. It comes from the heart. God has given us the power of choice so we can love him. He wants to win our hearts. He says, come now, let us reason together. What's the point of God reasoning with anyone? We can't understand his reasoning until he has regenerated us, until he gives us the grace. And when he does that, I mean, that's, that's it. Why is he reasoning with people that he's already predestined to hell for eternity? Uh, it, uh, it turns the Bible into a charade. It, it's a misrepresentation, in my opinion, of God's character. Now that brings us then to one of the strangest, I think strangest doctrines of Calvinism. Um, I didn't, I was not aware of it. All the discussions that I've had with Calvinist friends through the years, I was not aware of this. And um, it uh, rather shocked me. Um, and that is, well, let me read it to you. Only when the Holy Spirit regenerates man and makes him alive spiritually can man have faith in Christ and be saved. I quote you some others. A man is not saved because he believes in Christ. He believes in Christ because he's saved. A man is not regenerated because he has first believed in Christ, but he believes in Christ because he's been regenerated. We do not believe in order to be born again. We are born again in order that we may believe. Whoa, does that seem a little bit topsy-turvy to anybody? Uh, I was shocked. Well, here's how they will indoctrinate you uh, in a good Calvinist college. You're my, I'm the professor, you're my introductory uh, religion class. And I say, class, how many, what, what do you think? What comes first, faith or regeneration? Oh, you say. Faith, of course. Ah, uh, wait a minute, class. Don't you understand? The natural man is dead in sin. Now, how is a dead person going to believe? Well, class is a little bit confused. Well, I mean, I guess you're right. I mean, yeah, you know. Uh, you know I say, don't you understand? God has to sovereignly regenerate you. He's got to give you life before you can believe. And it's only after you've been regenerated that then he gives you the faith to believe. He can't give dead people the faith to believe. Well, Jesus did say, didn't he, in John 5, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. They apparently live because they heard his voice, and they only live after they've heard his voice, and these are dead people. He's talking about dead in trespasses and in sins. In contrast to what he says next, the hour is coming, not now is, talking about a resurrection, when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. Some of the resurrection of life, some of the resurrection of damnation. So the Calvinist has made a basic error. In order to impose his view on scripture, he has equated spiritual death with physical death. And you hear them talking about it all the time. A corpse can't do anything. Corpse can't believe. How can a corpse believe in Christ? Yeah, but of course, can't, a corpse can't disbelieve either, can it? A corpse can't sin or be held accountable. You made a, you've got a problem. You're equating spiritual death with physical death. But a spiritually dead person is physically alive. And they have the capacity to believe. They even have the capacity to do good things. Jesus said, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Jesus said that... Uh, we should do good. Didn't he say to his disciples, even, even the ungodly do that. They know how to be good at times. 
Uh, there are some, I mean, how are you going to explain? Here's an unsaved man, a, a soldier, and he throws himself on a hand grenade to save the lives of his buddies. That's happened. Well, we have to be regenerated. Listen to what John Calvin said. This is where it comes from. Uh, he's, you see, where, where would they, how would they support this from Scripture? Well, John 1, 13. Which were born, not of the flesh, not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And Calvin says, see there. You're going to be born again. It's got to be God. It's not man's will. God has to do it. I have uh, been studying this now for intensely for uh, over well, about a year and a half. I never found, I couldn't find any Calvinist writer who acknowledged that John 1.12 preceded John 1.13. They assiduously avoided, it seemed to me, verse 12. Well, let's go back to verse 11. He came unto his own, his own received him not, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God. You receive him, then you become a son. Even to those who believed in his name, then, verse 13 says, which were born. Not of blood or the will of man, the will of the flesh, but of God. So it very clearly says you believe, you receive Christ. Then you are born. Look, I can't force myself on God. I can't make him born me again, <laughs> you know. Uh, when Jesus said, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you. Well, the Calvinist takes that as a, as a great verse. But wait a minute. I have employed several hundred people in my life. I could say to any of my employees, <clears throat> you didn't choose me, I chose you. But that doesn't mean that I forced them to become my employee. They had to give their assent, right? All I'm saying is, you could not force yourself on me. I have the final say. I decide who I'm going to hire or not. But you still have to consent to this. We can't force ourselves on God. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. But it doesn't say the Father doesn't want to draw all. In fact, it does. It says he's not willing that any should perish. What does uh, 1 Peter 1, 23 say? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, what? By the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Doesn't that say that... I'm born again through the Word, then I believe the Word, then I'm born again. But the Calvinist says, oh no, 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 you can't do that because you're dead in sin. Uh, you've got to be regenerated sovereignly by God uh, before you can um, believe. Let me just quote R.C. Sproul. I think that's the name probably you would know. Uh, Infants can be born again, although the faith they exercise cannot be as visible as that of adults. Now we have another strange teaching of Calvinism. Babies are born again in the womb. Uh, and if you are the child of elect, then you are one of the elect. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can quote um, John Calvin. He says, quote, Hence it follows that the children of believers are not baptized in order that they may then for the first time become children of God, but rather are received into the church by a formal sign because in virtue of the promise, they previously belonged to the body of Christ. You understand that? He says, now baptizing an infant whose parents are not, believe, are not one of the elect, then they become one of the elect, their sins are forgiven and so forth. But when you're baptizing babies of the elect, you're not getting their sins forgiven. They're not being regenerated. They're not being brought into the church. They already are because they're the children of the elect. Probably most of us didn't have that, that blessing. Um, I think it makes a mockery of the Bible 
I already mentioned John 3.16, what Sunday school child would come up with the idea that Christ only died for some, that when he loved the world, um, that he doesn't mean the world, it means the elect. Choose you this day, all of his pleadings with Israel, sending his prophets, Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, let him turn unto the Lord, he will have mercy upon him. To our God, he will abundantly pardon. Uh, or uh, uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, uh, you will seek for me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. But no, you can't seek for God unless he regenerates you. This is what the Calvinist says. But the Bible is full of calling upon the wicked, the unrighteous, to turn to the Lord, to repent, uh, to, to seek him. We have a promise. Then they do contradict themselves. I'm quoting R.C. Sproul again. <clears throat> he says, quote, Once Luther grasped the teaching of Paul in Romans, he was reborn. Well, wait a minute. You've got to be reborn before you can grasp the teaching. But now and then, a little contradiction uh, slips out. The world, the word world, must be changed to elect in 20 scriptures. Whoever, whosoever, and all must be changed to elect uh, 16 times each. Uh, every man must be changed to elect six times. You have Luke 2, 9 through 11. Remember, the angel comes and he announces, what does he say? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to the elect. Is that what he said? Which shall be to all people. Now, wait a minute. How can, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. How can it be a great joy to people that God has already predestined to hell? So the Calvinist has to change that. All people really means the elect, you understand? We can't accept that it means all people. Uh, so uh, how do they get around this? Well, they have some techniques. I mean, what it means is all classes of people, slaves, some slaves, some royalty, you know, some aborigines, uh, some this, some that. Or they also have another uh, phrase that they use, without distinction, but not without exception. So I have a store, and I advertise in the paper, all merchandise 50% off. And you come, and there's an item you want, but I say, no, no, that's, that's full price. But, and this one's full price. But, but, but you said all merchandise 50% off. I didn't mean all without exception. I meant all without distinction. Some of this and some of that. Every kind of merchandise in here, some of it is 50% off. So the Calvinist says, when God so loved the world, he, he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to knowledge. Well, that doesn't mean without exception. It means without distinction. Some of this kind, some of that kind. So I think you have to begin to change the meaning of the Bible. I don't think an ordinary person uh, would, would get that. And incredibly, maybe most incredibly of all, uh, see if I can find this quote quickly. I think they've given me until 3.30, if you folks don't mind. Um, here's John Piper again. Listen, I first heard of John Piper from a friend of ours who was a missionary in Mongolia. This man has gotten around and very influential around the world. He says, we do not deny that all men are intended beneficiaries of the cross in some sense. What we deny is that all men are intended as the beneficiaries of the death of Christ in the same way. All of God's mercy toward unbelievers from the rising of the sun to the worldwide preaching of the gospel is made possible because of the cross. Every time the gospel is preached to unbelievers, it is the mercy of God that gives this opportunity for salvation. What? You're giving an opportunity for salvation to someone that God has already predestined to eternal damnation. And isn't this a wonderful manifestation of God's grace that you preach the gospel to them? Have these people gone mad? It's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. The cross, they're the beneficiaries of the cross in some sense. 
I said, it doesn't make sense. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, but God is kind to all because he gives the sunshine to some, everyone, you know, in the rain. Wait a minute, I'm sorry. That's like giving a, a nice meal to a man you're about to torture to death. Oh, it's kind to give a man a nice meal. Not in that context. How could it be kind for God to give, no matter how many, temporal benefits to someone he has predestined to eternal damnation? Didn't Christ himself say, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Uh, but the Calvinist has to do these things. Uh, it mocks mankind. And then, of course, the problem that we mentioned. How do you know you're one of the elect? Well, it gets into other problems here, uh, such as the Calvinist says, God only knows the future because he has predestined the future. Wait a minute. That's limiting God's omniscience. God is not omniscient if he can only know what he himself has predestined. And so they argue, if man has a free will, then he could surprise God. <clears throat> you have a teaching like that in, in America, I don't know whether it's gotten here yet, it's called The Openness View of God. Gregory Boyd, a Baptist uh, pastor, is teaching it. Uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission, maybe you're not aware of it, they've taught that for many years, uh, at least going back 30, uh, no, more than that, 30 years. Gordon Olson, a gentleman, was teaching it many uh, years ago. Joy Dawson has taught it for many years. God is surprised. He doesn't really know what's going to happen, but when it happens, then he as God, he steps in and tries to deal with it. But the Bible very clearly says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the cosmos, <laughs> right? Well, how could God know everything he's going to do if he doesn't know some things that men are going to do? And then he wouldn't be able to tell in advance what he's going to do in order to respond to what man is going to do. Well, yeah, but wait a minute now, look. If God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow, and God can't be wrong. So what God knows Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow, he's going to have to do tomorrow. Then how can Mr. Jones have a free will if God already knows what he's going to do? Well, the philosophers have discussed that for centuries. It's a very simple problem. Uh, another one of your own, uh, John Wesley. I think about 1780, he preached a sermon in which he said, I mean, man was right up to date on this for sure, uh, right up to date with modern science. The latest physicists would agree with this. Time is part of this physical universe. When the Bible says, in the beginning, I think Joe would agree with me, I hope. <laughs> it's the beginning of time. <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and part of what he created was time. It's part of this physical universe. God is not part of this physical universe. That's pantheism. <laughs> this universe is separate and distinct from God. He didn't create it out of himself. He created it out of nothing. So time has nothing to do with God. <laughs> He's timeless. I am that I am. And so uh, John Wesley very accurately said, God observes everything from outside. He sees past, present, and future. What is past, present, and future to us? He sees it as, as already, as it is. So the fact that God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do tomorrow does not cause Mr. Jones to do it, has no influence whatsoever upon what Mr. Jones is going to do. Well, we have a problem. How do you know you're one of the elect? You are saved eternally if you're one of the elect. I mentioned that I concluded I'm a zero-point Calvinist because I believe in eternal security for the wrong reason. Uh, let me quote R.C. Sproul, uh, who has some problems as a Calvinist. He says, a while back I had one of those moments of acute awareness and suddenly the question hit me, R.C., what if you're not one of the redeemed? What if your destiny is not heaven after all, but hell? 
Let me tell you, I was flooded in my body with a chill that went from my head to the bottom of my spine. I was terrified. I tried to grab hold of myself. I thought, well, it's a good sign that I'm worried about this. Uh, only true Christians really care about salvation. Then I began to take stock of my life. When I looked at my performance, my sins came pouring in my mind. And the more I looked at myself, the worse I felt. I thought, maybe it's really true. Maybe I'm not saved after all. Uh, Piper said, quote, our final salvation is made contingent upon the subsequent obedience which comes from faith. So you can't really know that you're saved until you're ready to die, and you can look back and say, well, I've lived a pretty good life. <laughs> no, what about the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Paul says his works are tried by fire. He doesn't even have one good work, does he? But Paul says if he had his faith in Christ, he is saved. Yet so is by fire. We're not saved by our works, and that is not the manifestation of whether we're saved or not. So I just want to remind you where we began. We, we haven't been able to really cover the topic, but I think we cover it very thoroughly in, in the book, as thoroughly as we could in one book. All the arguments that Calvinists will engage in, all he'll go to, uh, and we do, we go to uh, Romans chapter 9. What about Esau and Jacob? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Well, it's very clear. As it is written. Where is it written? Go find out where it is written. It's only written in one place. That's in Malachi. Not in the Old Testament. Never said that in the Old Testament. And it's very clear in Malachi. It is talking about the nations descended from Jacob and Esau. It is not talking about the salvation of either individual. It's very clear what, go back, and I, I go back and I don't find that the Calvinists quote this verse where God said, before she gave birth to these, to Jacob and Esau, God said to Rebecca, two nations are struggling in your womb. The elder shall serve the younger. If that was about the two individuals, Jacob and Esau, it was a false prophecy because the elder never served the younger in their lifetime, those individuals. But it's very true for the nations that descended from them. Uh, what about Pharaoh and so forth? Well, you go into all these arguments with them and what is the goal of the Calvinists? What are all the arguments, all of the turning to the Greek and the Hebrew and and all the complexities, and they're going to just overwhelm you with, with all of this. Uh, they've studied this so, so much, and you haven't. What is the bottom line? All of their arguments have one purpose, to prove God doesn't love everybody, to prove Christ didn't die for everybody, to prove that God is not kind to everyone. <laughs> And in fact, that he delights in sending multitudes to hell. What love is this? God is love. Love is kind. I think it's a misrepresentation of the God of the Bible. But you will have to come to your own conclusion as a good Berean. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we do bring before you our concern we don't want to cause division in the church, but Father, we want to stand up for your character. It's, the issue is not the sovereignty, your sovereignty. Lord, you are sovereign. You can do whatever you want to do. The issue is what do you want to do? And you've told us you're not willing that any should perish, that you so love the world, you gave your only begotten son to die, and that the world through him might be saved. And Father, we believe that and we ask that uh, you will clarify this in the hearts and minds of many, many people. We don't want to bring division in the church. Lord, we pray uh, that many eyes would be opened to who you really are and to your great love for all. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.